Welcome, everyone. We are back from a long hiatus for another Global Comic Safari. Today, we are doing an interview special. We haven't done one of these in a while or at all. I don't know. I can't remember. It's been a bit. Um, but uh, I've got a couple of the guys here with me. Matt, Define Triple Nine, is back. He's in a new pad, enjoying life in uh, out of the closet, so to speak. Uh, out of the closet. <laughs> the uh, new casa. We've got... Uh, Scott with us again, the foreign comic Mac Daddy, as he's decided today. <laughs> Glad to be back. Thanks, man. And our uh, special interview guest is Joey Enough. Welcome. Welcome, Joey. Joey. We're going to have a little discussion with him and his, his collecting history and his deep dive into the Indonesian market. So uh, just as always, I'd like to thank our friends at Comic Book Invest, CBSI, for the uh, number one free site for information and uh, <laughs> speculation, investing, and just general knowledge. So thanks to those guys. Check them out. And uh, thanks for promoting the show. And with that, um, you know about all the rest of us. We've talked a few times. Joey, tell us a little bit about how your relationship with comics, how you got into them, and you know how that dwelled into the foreign world. Okay. Uh, well... Thanks for having me, all you guys. Thanks everybody who's watching. I myself am uh, an avid watcher of this show. I think I've seen all of your previous episodes. So um, awesome! Thanks. Thank you. I feel like I've joined the whack pack here. <laughs> I mean, in a good way, you know. I'm talking in a radio talent way, and <laughs> nice, nice analogy. I like it. <laughs> and also, like all of you guys, I think that. Uh, I have certain uh, biographical affinities. I'm a lifelong comic book buyer. I have spent many years in um, comic retail and comic sales games, including um, 15 years where my family ran a chain of uh, comic book specialty retail stores on the island of Puerto Rico. Wow. Awesome. It's awesome. Which ran from 1984 to 1999. And um, in 1990, was uh, one of the most successful comic retail places on earth. According to Stan oh. Lee, he told my mom that uh, she had uh, moved the most Marvel comics per square foot of any retailer, at least for That's me. That's amazing. I mean, Stan Lee was a little bit of a hyperbolic guy, so I'm not going to you know, put it on Wikipedia, but That's no, a pedigree it, made, right it made her feel good. Either way, he's, it means she was moving some books for him to even yeah. know was. Sure. Did you guys know Panini's or just the Marvel, the U.S. material? Only, um, only the U.S. material. We had um, some imported Spanish language comic books, but they were not on American characters. They were more European properties like mm. Asterisk. And um, her, uh, you know, just European band is nice stuff. Okay. Interesting. So what, what, you know, what are you, so you were a young adult then, a child then, where were you kind of in that, that mix? Well, uh, I, I'm a child of the 70s, born in 1971. And, um, so teens and 20s through there. So I started, uh, as a professional comic in comics retail, you know, like I opened a distribution account at Diamond when I was 13. Wow. That's young. Wow. And this was uh, this is very early in Di when when Diamond was um, I guess it was just a couple of years into its uh, ascendancy as a national distributor. It wasn't the only one at that time, but uh, uh, Capital City was around. There might have been other ones that I'm forgetting about right now, but um, I, it was a lucky, a fortunate choice on my part to go with Diamond, and they were you know an awesome partner forever. So my mom and Steve Jeffy, you know, I think were. Uh, we're fans of one another, um, and um, and I know that my mom was a really good client of his for a long time. Awesome. Um, That's awesome. I, I, she had started off as, as a toy retailer and had, op and had um, opened up uh, a toy store 
in Puerto Rico after my parents had divorced in 1983. Um, my father was a Bell Labs electrical engineer, and, it's, and um, he stayed in the Northeast um, when, when, when we moved to Puerto Rico. Um, and that put me in a really nice position in having two separate parents buying comics for me. <laughs> That is a good position. Damn. Yeah. So this is this is where it all started is when I went to go visit my dad for Thanksgiving uh, the first year that they were split up. And although my mom was very indulgent of me and my comic habits, you know, and I had a, I think I was using Mile High at the time to get my um, my stuff. Uh, my subscription service was through Mile High, I think, like around 84. Wow. To the week that I went to go visit my dad in Haverhill up in Massachusetts for Thanksgiving of 84, I couldn't wait. So I ended up buying everything at Walden Books there and had this massive stack, which when I returned home, I had doubles of everything. Oh, I, put a, best. I put a box of, 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 of those comics on the counter at my mom's toy store, and it just so happened that the right people saw that and it became really renowned all over the island as a place where you could get comics. Um, and that was sort of the, the, the uh, inciting event that convinced my mom that she should front $750 you needed for a minimum order at Diamond. Well, it must it have went well. It really, it, it did well. It did, it did go well. Um, the, the, the big problem that I had moving to Puerto Rico is that there was not good newsstand distribution. That was a real jammer for me, uh, you know, because uh, in around 83, 82, 83, 84 is when direct market really started picking up. Lots of things happened in, in comic books around 82, 83, and 84. You know, uh, there's, uh, that, that was sort of a big surge from Marvel. That was where um, they did all the first limited series. They did yeah. the first exclusives to um, oh, retailers. When you look back now, you can see those books with the little Spidey sign in the box mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. the code. Um, so it was, you know, a major inconvenience to have no place other than supermarkets who had some of the more common, you know, I could get like a Peter Parker there, but I wouldn't be able to get like, um, I wouldn't be able to get Kitty and Wolverine. I forget or whatever the limited. Oh, yeah. Was. Kitty and Pride. Kitty Kitty. Pride. Oh uh, yeah, what, a, what a, getting yeah. Wolverine. You had you had to stick to the big guys. Yeah, and, and even worse, I had to drive out to the airport because that was, I think, one of the one places that really had a good. You could always go and get get stuff there. So when I first moved to the island, I, I had like a hobby as a thirteen year old kid of going all over the place trying to find any kind of place that would sell comics, and I, it took me into all these different neighborhoods and places in Puerto Rico, and uh, I was able to conclusively determine that there was no mm. import solution going on, um, and there definitely was no way that... Um, so you did it yourself. So I did yeah. it myself, <laughs> and I started, I, I, I did weekly orders probably all through eighth and ninth grade. I was doing the diamond it was ordering exactly how you would expect an eighth or ninth grade board. <laughs> Do you remember seeing Nova Dottis material? Yeah, any of the, the Spanish publishers that... there in Puerto. Nope. No, no and, and, uh, and, and never even had it suggested, even though we flushed out all the comic collectors in the island. You know, we, we, we got people and we we put classifieds everywhere on the island to buy old collections. You know, we'd go and visit houses and we'd, you know, we'd, we'd go into these rec rooms and see boxes of comics and buy the whole collection. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And I, but they were always in English language. And I, I bring that up oh. important because um, now there are people who, you know, are part of the FCC and part of our community and also part of just the trade that you see on eBay who will send you comics from Puerto Rico and they will be... Novartis Comics. They will be friends of comics. Mm -hmm. and they will have been purchased in Puerto Rico, but um, yeah, that Puerto they probably Rican didn't originate guy. there. It, it, I don't know whether I don't know whether they bought them there, kept them there, or what. But but for whatever reason, nobody ever brought us a collection to sell, or and, and um, nobody ever talked about them. So it's hmm. which 
plays into a contention I have, and it's probably a divergence of opinion with a lot of the community, where um, I, I believe that a lot of what happens in comic collecting happens privately, and that what you see is not what you get. That a lot of the piles and a lot of the archives and a lot of the stuff is just in people's rooms and in people's piles of stuff. Uh, and, and, and it just hasn't got flushed out yet. It takes a lot of it takes a lot of activity and momentum and interest and hype for people to really got, start digging through piles of old printed material on the expectation that they might find something super valuable. And fifty dollars or the possibility of it selling for hundred bucks probably isn't going to do it. What really changes the scene, and this happened in America in the seventies, was when something happens that has not happened in the foreign market yet happens uh, is is when normal everyday general interest newspapers start putting into circulation stories of treasures found in the attic that legitimately sell for thousands of dollars back then really it's like a seventeen hundred dollars if you could sell on record if you look through the 70s, like around 72, 74, 76, you'd be seeing these stories of like Superman number one or action number one. And like back then, what counted us a lot of money was the $1,500 to $2,000 range. Um, and this is something we've talked about a little bit on the group. And I do think it is super important. I think that when it breaks through and people start feeling that outside of an in-store group of, of collectors, that there's a real liquidity in $1,000 books, It'll be a revolution in people's back rooms and people's storage rooms and garages and attics, closets, bookshelves, uh, and that all of our assumptions about what exists and what shape it's existed in will have to be rewritten. Yeah, and I, and I don't disagree with you there. I think, I, I think that there's going to be some kind of difference in just volume of a mega. Uh, U.S. collecting habits versus other cultures and just general print run. You know, like we talked about yeah. Mexico had probably pretty solid print runs. Yeah. I mean, they were pretty big comic fans for a long time. But, you know, look at some of these smaller countries that that there just isn't the population. So there's going to be yeah. some kind of less supply. Now, is it, you know, we think it's 10 copies and ends up being 100 or 200 or 300, maybe. But, but it's definitely not going to be, you know, American market where there's one you could find every day. So yeah. There, there's somewhere in between these two theories that's going to probably flush out of rare. And that's a, that's a lot of the risk that we're taking. I mean, I'm very comfortable with that. I, I think yeah. a lot of the times we have to go into a country and we have to proceed and sometimes pay premium prices for stuff without knowing is this the last time we're going to see it or are we going to see 100 copies we, we, yep. you know, that is the price you pay us an early chapter. oh yeah yeah so after yeah. matt like say after how go back to when i first met matt in 2013 there were books we thought were relatively accessible and then they suddenly become inaccessible and the buying opportunities are gone that does that mean they're uber rare uh they're probably locked in collections, but even when you start throwing big offers out there, they, they tend not to show up. But we like don't the Mexican have Iron Man one or the Submariner. But, we, but, but when you talk about throwing out big offers, don't think about that as a personal thing where you go out and you're like, hey, you know, I'll pay you this much. Think about it in terms of very big public anonymous offers and liquidity an available anonymously. So that if you can sell a book without ever having even known the name of the buyer, that's a level of liquidity that is more tangible and more actionable than the kind of true, you know, existent but non-public liquidity that we have amongst one another. So yeah. it, it, unless somebody knew one of us or knew somebody who we knew, they wouldn't know about those offers. It's different when like Heritage is selling books for thousands of dollars and then a paper who nobody knows is putting it on their weekend entertainment coverage as a, as a, as a local interest. Yeah, and I, and I will also agree that you know even even in you know like an established country going back to Mexico, we know some Mexican collectors, but they are only so much of the market. There's you know they they have regional level connections or they know certain people, but there's definitely this other 
group of the population that's not not even involved in comics. Or well, them. and especially as the older you get, they're going to be less likely if they're hiding in older collections to have at you know to be all over the internet and all over social media the way we are. So that's I think for, I think for sure question. there's stuff there's stuff hiding out i think i think to scott's point though i think what's happened with how certain issues will dry up is it's like the low-hanging fruit scenario you know all those books that were there and they were going to be available at the time in the networks at the time for the amount of money at the time sort of got gobbled up and then hidden away um now the op will will the change happen and then like you said, Joey, as as more and more anonymous money starts coming into it, it's, we're going to see a more true or accurate representation of what is truly hard to find or hard to source. But I think also over a length, a period of time, um, I would argue that we have to appreciate the opinions of a lot of the collectors in those countries that have been watching and looking for years that then do come back and say, well, the, I, as you know, as a collector in this country that's been doing it for decades, I think I can say that that Mexican book or that Filipino book or that whatever book is hard to find. I think on some of that level, I, I, I take what those collectors say and, and I, don't, I, I, I do think there is some ring of truth to it. Now, who knows? I mean, it's just like with the Mile High collection. You know, there's there's there could be tons of collections just sitting somewhere in storage and people don't even know. But the reverse is true on the New Zealand comic group. Uh, I read a post that horrified me where there was someone talking about how this old collector ended up dying of a stroke. And he had all of this New Zealand material, which I didn't think there was a lot of, but apparently there is. And it was sitting in like storage and his family was going to throw it away. You know, so I also wonder if, as time goes on, if that value question, if, if we don't get that kind of big money influx into the niche, how many of these older books that are sitting out there are going to end up destroyed or they're not going to even be aware of its value? So I, I hope it happens soon because I think with, with we're dealing with some of these older, especially some of this older Golden Age foreign stuff, you know, um, at least in Brazil, I feel like they have an awareness that it has value. But I would be afraid that maybe there's there's some golden age foreign stuff sitting somewhere random, you know, someplace in Mexico that is just going it, to it, – it's too late for it. It's never going to come out. It's going to end up in a dumpster. That's my fear on that part of it. But, yeah, I mean, it's – I, I it's hear you. Cool, I, I, cool, cool. Go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say I have, I have four things I want to say to that, but go – First. No, I was going to say I, I think it's a it's a it's an interesting question to ask, and it's and it's the way it relates to the the kind of initial investment spec value of foreigns. I mean, it is it is a risk, um, but we I don't know. It's like one of those things we really don't know until more of these books start coming out of the woodwork. I I, I like your idea, Joey. I, I like the. I like looking on the bright side and knowing that there's going to be more demand. Well, it's not I mean, the bright I, side. It's, it's a risk for us. Oh, no, yeah. For, because, uh, you know, one thing that I did recently, and I shouldn't share this because it's really depressing, but I have to because it's very real, is uh, somehow when I was going through some boxes of stuff, I came upon a cache of uh, money order receipts, and they were uh, just the carbon copies you get when you write out when you buy a money order from the post office uh, that I used to pay for every collectible that I purchased on eBay in the 90s before PayPal and since I made really good use of the memo field and wrote exactly what I was paying for you know I was able to look between 20 and 25 years later on a lot of these things that I still own and see my purchase price on them and Mm -hmm. It made me think back to those to like the first five years of eBay, uh, and how the difference between like the first five years of eBay and the subsequent twenty years after, uh, and 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 reminded me of what I was thinking 
when I was uh, when, when I was buying some of that stuff. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that like I look back in horror, but some things I did pay a lot of money for with the expectation that they were super duper rare, and they turned out to not be that rare. Mm -hmm. And I bid against people who also had that same, and we just couldn't know. Just What's an example yeah. of that? Hindsight give me, 2020. Give me, give me your hindsight horror story. Give me an example. Um, Tell me it wasn't a beanie baby, Joey. <laughs> spawn, spawn foil. <laughs> I can okay. I'll, let me. I'll, I'll tell you about. I'll tell you about three of them. <laughs> One of them was the European printed Robert Crumb Book of Filth hardcover edition. Oh. One of them was um, <clears throat> a nineteen sixty era cast your own monster in plaster kit sealed. Mm. And another was the fifties era Mister Potato Head Goes to the Moon sealed. Huh. And uh, <laughs> and um, and there's more of the potato head seals. And all of them. Uh, wow. The bottom. The bottom didn't collapse out of any of those. Okay. Mm -hmm. But nor did. But enough copies, enough items that matched the condition of everything I had emerged to keep the price static over 25 years which is on its own depressing yeah except for the fact that these were cool things and i like yeah. them and I, you know yeah. I, I must still like them because I'm, they're not you know yeah at least one you or still have them <laughs> it's still on display and it's still it, it's yes if unlike I, the print code horror that we actually I'm, didn't appreciate in the 90s and then when everyone started wanting them we found out they're really quite rare especially in grade so that was a good. That was a. That was one that went in the right direction. But I know what you're saying. You might have had some I, artifact. I argue that that's more of a demand thing versus the supply. I, I, I mean, agree. I, I, well, I also agree with that a little bit. I think that there's much, much, much greater demand for the pre-code horror than anybody imagined. They're rare, but you know, it's like the ECs were not as rare as we thought they were. Was my point? Like in the '80s, they're still rare enough to be constantly going up in price. Because the yeah, demand, demand still outstrips even the, the the increased supply. So to there's a little bit of an academic sense where I say, oh, a bunch more copies are going to be discovered. I know they will be because I think it's impossible for us to uh, to correctly estimate the density of this world. I just think like it's possible to like remember how many people there are, how well, many houses so there are. <laughs> even, know, even I mean, the supply and demand, even books like ASM 300, the yes. New Mutants 98 in our heads, like uh, 10 years ago, these are common books. ASM had a standard value for almost a decade. And then all of a sudden, demand boom went through the roof and the book doubled or tripled. Well, Hulk 181 to me is the epitome. Like that, there's nothing rare about that. Right. Mm -hmm. But so many people want it, it's gotten expensive. Well, watch Miles. Well, Miles. It's very interesting, though, because it has been an accumulation mode for 30 years, maybe 40. People were accumulating 181, you know, seriously in 1984, 85, 86. It was something you wanted, and it wasn't nothing. It didn't cost nothing. I mean, Wolverine got big, and he got big fast. Yeah. It's appreciated in a linear way since. Um, and actually, that's one, another reason why I've been so complimentary. Just, to, John, if you're looking at this stuff in investment, it's just the fact that people haven't stopped and taken stock of just how well as an asset class comics have actually proven themselves to be over the last 60 years. It's not like a random, it's not trivia or an accident um, or meaningless that they've held value and increased in value. Lots of other things have not. Yeah. Most things don't. So the fact that it does tells you something important that's not random. It's not Beanie Babies. Beanie ba yeah. Babies haven't. You know? It doesn't have the same ephemeral appeal to the culture that, say, comics. So they're more lasting. L like by an order, yeah. I mean, one order of magnitude. They're, they're, there's a intrinsic value there. Yeah, well, I mean, there's charge of the same thing, you could argue. And, you know, they, they had their same kind of glut and and devaluation in eras, but 
as sports cards have kind of stood that test of time. Probably. Well, I, I don't know the I don't know the field enough well, to make a smart comment on that. Now, like Joey, like me, me and Matt and John have talked about the the indigenous bias and how certain countries have their material and they don't appreciate it. But I, we find that people are starting to appreciate their material. And I know people in Indonesia have pride in, in a local culture in their material. Do you, what's your sense of the um, barometer on that current appreciation within their own market? And then are they, do you think they're aware of the international attention that it's getting yeah, and this is a great question. This is besides like, Ahmad, besides our friend Ahmad. <laughs> yeah, besides <laughs> Ahmad's obviously not the only person. <laughs> yeah, of course. Selling books to foreigners, but yeah, just what are your thoughts? It's a huge, a huge, a huge question, and it's a, it's something that I think about for every country I collect because I think it's fascinating. Um, and Indonesia is atypical. I don't, uh, I, I, although uh, I think Matthew just made. Um, or just in your question, Scott, you might have referenced Brazil and how they have a sense of value for their yeah their stuff. They appreciate um, it, and um, Indonesia is the same way. And I just want to be honest: like when we talk about a sense of value, we mean like stars in their eyes. I'm going to get rich off this. That's what a sense of value is with comics. Maybe, because maybe it, in both, maybe both in the sense of. I'm a comic collector and I want these things because I enjoy them. So I'm going to seek them out. They don't necessarily have to be expensive because that's how we all got started in the eighties. Right. These things weren't terribly expensive. So, but you, but you know, when something is a rare treasure, that's the thing that comics do. Comics will give you something and you'll take a look at it and you'll be like, well, it probably shouldn't exist. It's amazing it got produced in the first place, that it stays in shape as a miracle. Like there's all these levels of miracle that it even exists and that it th that it's around. And you just think, wow, the reason why this is great, and the reason why it's collectible is because um, it was randomly excellent. It was unexpectedly excellent. And as time goes on, its excellence will be more obvious, and the original limited notion of its uh, 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 limited circumstance of its original distribution will seem more insane. But you know, you can't know what's going to be popular until after, till after it comes. So I, I think a lot of the collectors understand if a comic book in this world is expensive, and the things that drive expensive are one that it's super duper rare and hard to find, and very close to irreplaceable, and two, that it looks cool as hell, then I think a lot of people in, in different countries are like, yeah, this is this should be hundreds of dollars. Joey, I would I would say this too. I'm gonna add on to your question, uh, Mr. Mac Daddy, because mm -hmm. it's not just the money though for me. I, I right. would say like um, in a third world country, I think, so let's take Indonesia. If we can just get some of the people, some of the collectors there, to look at com at, at their indigenous comics that's simply not throwaway entertainment, something well, that not might not necessarily have value, but just to keep it, to actually keep it, to store it, to to understand. Because there's some in some countries. I'll give, use Philippines as an example. Um, I talked to many Filipino collectors, and for many of them, they'll say, "Yeah, it was just considered. It was just read it, throw it away. It, not even beyond." The, the foreign indigenous bias, which is them thinking that their local stock material is, is different than the American material, just simply getting in some of these third world countries the idea that the comic book it has its own value as even just something to read and store. I would hope that, that you know, they okay. would at least appreciate but, but, but that brings me to a bigger point that was uh, one of the things that I, 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 I had bookmarked mentally to mention about like what we're going to find out about print runs and what we're going to find out about the real global inventory as time as time goes on. Um, I think it's a myth and I don't think it helps us as collectors to, um, even if it's not a myth, to believe in this idea that 
comic books as a phenomenon in any country are literally disposable. I think that is super overstated. Mm -hmm. The idea that like comics, you know, they, they, they won't they won't survive. Yes, they will. Yours did, mine did, lots of them. I go to houses all the time of people who aren't even comic collectors, and you and, and you see them. Uh, you know, they're not composting. <laughs> and you, and they're not. They're, 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 they might not be in great shape, but people don't. You, you can imagine that, like, it all gets printed and then it's just like all into the bin. No, 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 no. It hasn't been true here. It hasn't been true. I, I don't see it to be true in any market. And to assume it is is to give yourself credit that could hurt you in the end because you're underestimating the whole scarcity index. You're 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 basically doing an improper census, even if it's just an imaginary kind of mental calculation. All right, we saved our National Geographics and everything, so I I think your point's well stated. Um, and that's also part of like you know, and also paper products aren't as degradable as people sometimes think they are. I even I, in the yeah. library in science. Paper lasts longer than anybody ever imagined. It really does last. Older I, periodicals from hundreds and hundreds of years old were predicted to be deteriorating, aren't. I, I think there's gonna be some countries that it less survives just in nature. It just is whatever, depending on the state of the country, war zone, things like that. I, it is great. We, we can argue that the base print runs are gonna change. I, I wanna jump back a little bit because you kind of, same same realm of question, but we were talking about the the collectors seeing the article in the paper that that they had sold you know the, the comic from their country sold for thousands of dollars. What we're what we're not taking into account is a lot of times we're buying these private sale from somebody in the country who's found them who's probably paid significantly less than we're going to pay. So that end seller the person with the inventory is not seeing that huge profit somebody in the There's, middle is is you know making yeah. a, a 10 20 40 fold increase in what they bought it for so which is, which is great for us but that's a sign of immaturity in the hobby exactly the fact that the fact that it's like that means that there's a bunch of people who are just using common sense to not blow up their own spot and like ruin their own game when they've got a good situation like i'm not judging anybody for doing that you, you, you're going to do what makes sense for you as a collector to do it's just you know we're hostage to the time we're in and we can't rush the future it, i mean it can happen a lot faster than we think but it's going to take time for the knowledge to uh you know percolate past insider market inefficiency is all it is super super inefficiency yeah well, we, like, it, it, we assume that eBay is a global market, but it's not. I mean, it's no. a hell no, hell no. It's no. a it's a U.S. market. It, you know, some some parts of Europe, and we all know you have to jump on all these other sites, and some of these sites don't really aren't designed to sell out of country and so, sell yeah. to each other. And we all know this. So you have to have a middleman until there's a true easy global market that that all these countries are actually on. That's kind of connecting all these connect collectors. You know. Yeah, and easily accessible to it doesn't have to be easy, but easier than it is now. No one's going to see that that happen. What you're talking about, I think, is the problem. That is exactly what's been happening. That's what the last eight years have been. In 2012, um, these third party marketplaces emerged as a hot category for digital investment. This happened in, in not just in the U.S. but around the world in all global markets. So in the intervening time, that's, I mean, Mercado Libre was around before then, but in the interval, every country on earth got some version of um, auction. A list space. Yeah. yeah, sales, a direct sales space where vendors could, could put stuff. A so cyber market. Every, some, some different type of cyber market. And those ended up all around the world being very successful. So I think that that has changed the game. So to go back, back to another point, um, which uh, I oftentimes think about when Scott, you and, and Matt, and some of you guys who have been collecting forums for a long time, characterize the field and characterize availability and characterize what you've been told by old collectors. Um, unfortunately, you're getting a penalty, SNR, I believe. Possibly, you are getting a perceptual penalty as early adopters, because 
you have a lived experience of difficulty and scarcity and tracking down stuff that is tied in to those old years and ch changes by the day. Things are much more available, and even in the last two years, since Facebook's pivot to groups, which we are an outgrowth of in this mm -hmm. conversation in a way, is, has also had a massive global impact. I think that the that, that, that post-election, Facebook deciding that they wanted to make a concerted effort to pivot to market to, to, to marketplace and groups, which has ended up becoming more of a pivot to groups, because I don't think that the marketplace features ever really kind of gelled perfectly for Facebook. Yeah, I don't think so either. That has changed and as in the process of turning them into um you know one of the major can't ignore platforms for this kind of trading no, no well, I, that's that's very that's truly insightful because i mean we'll see you know somebody from a country pops into the group and all of a sudden it's like a feeding frenzy yeah like yeah, that hungarian guy that hungarian guy went crazy selling hungry stuff Joey, Joey, you're you're right in the that we as pioneers are taking a risk. I mean, we all talk about Patron in the very beginning, Hector the having Patron. to pay to get scans. Yeah. He didn't even know if it existed. So yeah. he laid the groundwork for everyone to know that this 300 set existed. So it makes everyone else's life easier because he broke the barriers of the market inefficiency. Mm -hmm. So he he helped mature it. To where yeah. more people can get in, which creates more demand, which probably offsets any um, additional books coming to market. Because maybe to your point, Joey, some dude from Hungary signs up, and now we have access to more Hungarian editions. Yeah, that happened with Brazilian books. We didn't have access to Brazil for a long time, and then all oh, of a sudden yeah. we got Wasi, and now you've got you Dino, know Dino Victor. Yeah, like I could, the list goes on. And I don't, I think it's a good thing because the market needs material to trade hands in order yeah. to set precedence for prices and it creates maturity. Yep. And at the same time, I think to your point, you don't get hung up on the fact that we think there's two copies of something. It's really the buying opportunity. And if you're a yeah. collector and you want a book in your collection, you have to take the calculated risk that am I going to see this again or should I pay a premium? And that's really what determines. Mm -hmm. It's like who's who's the foolish one or <laughs> who has the most money to throw at something wins and the next one that comes along may sell for cheaper or it may sell for more. Like the, the Hebrew Hulk's a good example of one where yeah. it was a $50, $60 book I was helping someone and they're like, you know what, should I pay 200 because the guy won't budge? I'm like, just do it. And it ended up being probably a smart move because we've Super. only seen a few more and those yeah. sold for in the three fifties. Now but that's, 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 that's the same way that our perception gets warped because $200 isn't expensive. No, no, I agree. What you know, like, on. we get it's so relative. good. These, well, but that, relative to any comics in America, like $200 doesn't even get you like last year's hot, I know. Foil cover. No, I, 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 think, I think Matt and I have had some, you know, some some discussions on that because he's like, well, you know, we've paid this price price traditionally, and I'm like, yeah, but to me, it's worth X, and I still think that's a great deal. Yeah. And I'll pay it. Um, you know, yeah. I, when I bought the big booty Gwen from you, you're like, here's what he's looking for. I'm like, great. I didn't think two seconds, two hundred dollars is not. You didn't. You didn't think, and and to this day, uh, I think uh, the seller of that book regrets selling it <laughs> you can't well, regret I, it though so most of these yeah. books have what's, what's the most expensive sale we know of on a foreign uh it's mm. the it's the the mexican conan it's ten thousand yeah. bucks for the oh Coin yeah for the, okay so track that that was a track sale on ebay so that's yeah there's so little information out there even even the big podcasters that are you know listening to information from the group and talking about it there's so little to talk about because it takes a huge number in this foreign market to, to peak interest, you know, when but that's, that's not really an international book. That's a Mexican only book. No, but I, I know what you mean. I, well, I'm just trying to say like, is there something it's else out there? Edition. It's, it's a Mexican edition. It's a Mexican, but there was just no American equivalent. So, yeah. because that wasn't an American no. coming in. No. So, it, so people, I mean, it, that, that is remarkable. It's, an it's a foreign remarkable. book in a foreign language that's, I know it's not off the radar. It's off the radar of the standard collector mindset. Yeah. I think 
but I understand the point you're making. If it was a reprint, uh, if it was the edition of the Mexican La Prenza FF1 versus an FF, then that would probably be more It would have more parallel. of a like, effect. Yeah. But I guess but, what but, I'm... But, but, it is a massive achievement to sell 10,000 out of any Conan book. And it is a comics achievement and a comic sales achievement. It just... Uh, okay. It, so, it so it, it, through domestically probably the same way. What's so like, what was so the like Mexican, you, there's uh, the French or was it the French or Danish the Smurf issues? Those are there's no known American equivalent, so those don't really count in our discussion, I guess, is where you're at. Yeah, I mean, I just would have no way mm. of trying to create, you know, a, a return, an ROI concept on Smurf memorabilia. I mean, would you even be talking about is that a con is that even primarily comics or is that toys? You know, you're, you're talking about some of this like Smurfs are much more culturally significant in Europe. You know, like I don't even know the way. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just, I get where you're at is that we are talking almost a couple different markets. There's the, there's the editions of American books. Then, you know, you're in the Indonesia, which, you know, it's, it's a lot of bootleg stuff. And, it, yeah. you know, and, uh, the uh, nine, and yeah. so there, there, there's kind of the, all these different markets of, What's yeah. going to catch up interest? Is it going to be the, the the set versions? Is it going to be the unique material of common characters, or is it going to be the completely out there items that that are you know just tertiary? I, I, I think that it always gets back to things that have instant eye appeal, which is true for a lot of keys already. Like you forget them because you're so we're so invested in them, but that a lot of the books that we chase and have been chasing for decades. We started chasing them the second we saw them. <laughs> you know, you see, like, oh. it, like it didn't take a lot of propaganda to say that I wanted Fantastic Four number one. You know, I, I wanted that damn thing. And that's yeah, like me and, and the big booty Gwen. I wanted that damn thing. I wanted it as soon as and, I saw it. And I feel like that's the fundamental action in comic collecting is seeing something and just like being dumbfounded by how cool it looks and how old it is and how rare it is and just the whole thing about it is just like i love it of course it's expensive and i want it and someday i'm going to get it like the whole <laughs> thing comes together in a second uh and, and for me i don't know why and this is a purely mechanical distinction i just can't see somebody an american seeing like a pro uh, a, 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 a record setting sale of a smurf comic and being like you know what that's for me yeah, I get you. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe. Let's so, let's segue. What, what, go ahead, go ahead, Scott. No, I was just gonna say when you talk about American books being expensive and two hundred and get, doesn't go far, I still think I I, I have an issue with that whole premise because a five thousand dollar book is a five thousand dollar book, and there are not many people that can afford that. So, even if I go back in my nineteen eighty world. Think, there's more than I think because there's more people that are doing it. So it doesn't, um, I guess I'm saying that a $200 book, it's 200 is still a lot of money for a book. It is. 200, 200 is yeah. a, lot, a, a lot of money, but the people what? who are spent, but a lot of the $200. It doesn't, it doesn't tweak the market at the other end. Well, I'm there's saying a it's a, the relativity of, so like the, let's I know the Mexican market. So the La Prenza market, where I tend to focus most of my time, you could get these books for like five to fifteen dollars a piece for a long time. Now to get something is like forty to fifty, and you can even pay a couple hundred for a minor key. It's getting relatively more expensive. Like with Indonesian books, I'm gonna guess that it's probably, you know, five to twenty-five dollars a piece for the average book. There's probably gonna be some that everyone hits up a mod for and he can get a premium for them. Yeah. But the question is, at what point does those supplies dry up? They're gonna start getting expensive. And I just mean relative to the current market values. So there's what? gonna be a tracking history based on supply and demand and awareness. Well, well, and you're Scott, let me let me let me just put let me just let's just put this thing into a global context and like let's attach some numbers to this um, because uh, you have to like if you go back in time and you think about populations around 1970, you know the, the in the U.S. to be like 
the, the America had 200 million in, in, uh, citizens in, in, in 1970. Mexico had 50. Brazil and Indonesia both had around 100 million. But Mexico and uh, in particular um, Novaro were distributing everywhere. In the year 1960, Navarro accounted for 1% of the entire GDP of Mexico. The entire GDP of the country of Mexico was comic books, 1%. Wow. So that, that's, that's why you, you've got to be really realistic about what we think exists out there. Like, you might imagine that there were not a lot of comics. You might be imagining 180 from reality. In reality, they might have been the biggest comic consuming population on earth and have been doing more distribution than any originating publishing country on earth because they were distributing both Spain and mm -hmm. all of Latin America. South America, Latin, yep. Uh, you know, so so even though they might be the same, so it's, so we have to take a look at every. You know, likewise, if you look at Brazil, um, they might have, in their minds, separated out both the domestic and just the larger Portuguese language markets. Um, and and uh, you know, they were all the, every publisher, and every dealer is going to be super aware of all of their contingent marketing opportunities and all of their distribution because somebody, you know, somebody was paying. I mean, we even find Marvel licensed material from Marvel from the 70s when they didn't even have an international mar marketing arm. I mean, I don't think they mm -hmm. can do official international marketing until the late 80s, even though, you know, some people just chased them down and threw money at them and said, here's our, 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 our license. Um, so you, you have, I, I think you have to look at that different. And that's why with 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 um, Navarro and La Prensa in particular, I think that uh, we have a lot to learn. Like, I don't think you're wrong to you're not going to be you're not going to ever look back in 10 years and be like, oh, I shouldn't have been an early adopter in Prensa or Navarro Keats. But I really got screwed because a lot of them came I think you're going to be fine and you're going to always get a return. But I think if anybody's going to be shocked at how much stuff crawls out of the wood, wood, woodwork, or woodwork, sorry, it's going to be somebody who collects Spanish language stuff originating from Mexico. Because um, I think it's impossible for us to correctly estimate just how popular uh, entertainment media color comics were in the 60s and 70s uh, in Mexico and Latin America. So, yes, you're going to have. All kinds of crazy, unexpected distributions of condition, and you know we're going to have to look in retrospect and see at the point when we can look at a census for these markets, how, how they balance out. Um, but we know what's going to happen is that in the end, any market with a lot of remaining and surviving inventory is going to sway toward a uh, condition focus. So it's going to become, you know, it's going to become great oriented. That's why I think the smartest thing you could do today. Is wait for big keys to come up that are in higher and grade, and that are in higher grade, and just pay the fucking asking price. <laughs> just buy them. <laughs> you know, like I think John is going to be the least regretful of anything because he's never going to sell a high grade Gwen a wedding issue for eighteen hundred dollars again. Like that time is gone, or two thousand is it's it's done. Everybody knows that that's a blue chip for him. We and know of a, of a high grade big booty Gwen that got what grade did it get, John? Nine point two, four, nine point four. I I saw that and I was like, that is a ten thousand dollar book in my mind. Maybe yeah. not this year, maybe not next year, maybe not three years from now, but at some point, some really hardcore perverted asshole is going to want a nine point four big booty Gwen, and he's going to pay of ten thousand. Of course they are. Of course they are. How, how? Why wouldn't people want a rare <laughs> spider cake? It's just, I mean, we, like even though it's different than American, like we know that there is a global population of committed, lifelong, not going to change around Spidey fans. It's massive global brand. Those keys are going to get canonized just in the same way that every little loose end in the Spider Verse ends up coming back to the Motherverse. It, you know, and it's it's not going to be 
outsider for too long. It's going to be inside the temp very, very, very fast. And the high grade is where it'll pop. The mid grade stuff is also going to go up. Joey, yeah. when, when you look at the, the books that have gone through your hands from Indonesia, do you find the typical grade range and like what percent do you find in higher grades? Uh, I, Just sort of anecdotal insights that your your experience, not, uh, I'm not I, interested in like theory and stuff like that. It is very rare to find what they call NOS, new old stock is how they refer to excellent or mint or whatever we would we would call near mint higher grade they call they will they, they'll label it as nos new old stock new old stock yeah. okay and um those are rare but they exist and when you see them you can't believe them in it, it it's mind opening I, I, I can show you some in the 70s in indonesia those comics actually got distributed in sealed bags hmm. you know kind in, of in stacks or individually no, in in individual bags and uh, let me really that's interesting poly bags i wouldn't have thought that at all poly bags so they could reuse them so back in the in the 70s you know you had these digest size and i will often get these really beaten copies uh but the way that they were they were shipped was like this or if you can see it, there's a plastic bag. Yeah. Still oh, wow. It's like a shrink wrap. It's like a shrink yeah. wrap. Basically a shrink wrap. Yeah. Huh, uh, wow. And, I've never seen one in a shrink wrap. That's pretty cool. And you blew, just blew my mind there. It's blew my mind too, because uh, you know, now you have to, I have to like compare every copy I have like, Oh, where's my shrink wrap? No, that's interesting. Cause like Matt, it, you, we think about the whole bag and board culture yeah. mantra. And this in some way ca counteracts that. It can help explain why you could have higher grade books, maybe in a particular country like Indonesia, that you would think with the environment being, you know, humid and in yeah, near the would equator would be, more, would be a lot more, um, uh, those books take a toll. So well, you know, a, di a, a distribution quirk like that helps maybe that way. I'm sure somebody like on one of the investment pages would say that you know the really responsible thing to do is to take it out of its bag. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. but uh, you know another indication that uh, of of longevity that you get from Indonesia is just the popularity in the '70s of the phenomenon of um, library style lending and Rent. rental. Costs. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Are you, Joy? Are you just? I think we kind of know what you're talking about, but for people me, watching, are you saying that you might have an adult or a teenager set up a booth and people just come up and read the books? Like maybe they pay 10 cents equivalent and they get to read books, that kind yeah. of a thing? I don't, I, don't, I don't exactly know. I just know that, uh, I mean, as far as the business model that they're using, I don't exactly know how professionalized they were, whether the lending was for a week, a day, or I, I don't know what it was, but you can buy these, you can get books that have, clearly have reinforced binding. Um, sometimes you see some of the, I, I think the multi-volume threaded binding is in the context of these sort of roadside um, private libraries. And uh -huh. you also see a very traditional library card full uh, pocket and cards. Oh, where they put their information? On the inside of some hmm. comics. Uh, so I, I think that that tells you something, it tells you that there are places in the world where even 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 if comics were the cheapest possible, the literal cheapest entertainment, you know, penny for pe your pennies on those, it still was outside um, people's budget. Oh yeah, you saw in South. I know South America did that as well. You'd go, mm -hmm. you'd you pay, you know, a few pesos, and you'd sit there with a coke and read and absorb as many comics as you possibly could. I know India did that as well. Yeah, we um, have we have black and white photos. Of it, of of okay. where? Um, I don't know the country. They're South American countries, I believe. Franco Quiroz posted those. Oh yeah, they show that they show the road li the roadside libraries, whatever you want to call them, and people would rent books, basically just you know sit there and pay and read. That's so cool. I think to your point though, Joey, it's that even 
regardless of the economic situation, they still paid for entertainment, but they couldn't afford the actual book. Yeah. So the books, the but, books could still be consumed. It, 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 well, I don't have one very good point. I have like three sort of halfway interesting points. But one of them is that there was a demand enough that it would support a lending system. Mm -hmm. that, there was, that there was sort of a sense of value enough that that, that that would occur to people, that you wouldn't sell, but that you would retain it, and that you'd have a stream of people who would want to come and get it. And also, I just think it's sort of suggestive of um, a sense of values, you know, that they, they value these things. Hmm. Hey, uh, let, me, let me interject here real quick, because we're getting close to an hour. Joey, b before um, we move on, I think what I really wanted to know from this interview was how you got into foreign comics specifically. I want to, I want to, I want to hear that story before. Okay. All right. Before we're done today. Okay. Um, Cause that is, uh, it's a story that I have been sort of retelling to myself and remembering <laughs> action Point, you know the inflection points um, that got me interested. I, I, I sent you guys earlier a link to this one particular book that really fired my imagination back around 2003 or 2004. Uh, it was called uh, it was called Comic Art in Africa, Australia, Asia, and South America. I forget what the name of the book. Uh, the, yeah, there you go. By this John Aylin, and I didn't buy the book. Hmm. But just seeing that title opened up my mind. Because, you know, it looks like it doesn't it doesn't look like a, you know, a hot comic book. It looks like a self-published index. And it's mm -hmm. like really expensive. And even if today, if you go to buy it, I mean, you have to pay like 100 bucks for it. So I didn't buy it. And I'm glad I didn't because now if you look at Google Books, you can actually get interior reviews and see a lot of the stuff in there. Yeah, but there's a ton of info. I was just kind of mm. thumbing through it initially. And I mean, there is, it is big. It's not like. Yeah, this is a lot of citations. I mean, I'd love to. This thing is, is well researched. A lot of it is also strip and illustrations. And yeah, it's not. Things. I yeah. mean, it's all over the world of cartooning. So it's not comic book focused Specifically. As, as we tend to be. Um, but I also, you know, I. Uh, also a fan of editorial cartoons and every other cartoon medium. So I still probably will buy that book now that I remembered it. But that was probably the first time that I started thinking, man, all these other countries in the world also have publishing histories. And, you know, they they might have put out interesting comics. And I, I remember uh, I remember talking to Dennis Kitchen of Kitchen Sink about this and, and him agreeing that, boy, it's going to be really interesting when we can go in and dig into these countries. And, and this and, was 2003, Joey? This must have been like a 2000, yeah, must have been the early 2000s because I, I was um, that, that, I, I, I was not buying any foreign books back then, but I was buying a lot of American comics and art. I was a big Harvey Kurtzman original art collector, and you know I collected a lot of stuff from all the original EC artists um, uh, in terms of original art. Um, so that was probably like the first thing that I saw. And then the second thing that that um, blew me away and got me actually hunting for foreign comics was when I came upon a Tumblr post by Ken Worthing. Back in ah, the Ken. Back the in king the of foreign cats. Yeah, and he showed a copy of the Indonesian Captain America uh, 110, the Steranko. Oh, yeah. 110 with the Hulk, yeah. And it was clearly, that. like, not just an addition. It was a redraw. Yeah, it was a redraw. And uh, I thought that was amazing because I was doing all kinds of interactive work in my capacity as a, as a, as a computer developer and a front-end developer and a guy who likes to do interactive comics-related work. Uh, so I was very interested in versions and ver weird versionings and transitions between different versions. And I, I wanted to get a hold of that and looking for that specific book and actually finding out how difficult it was and how 
if I, if you'll forgive me, not helpful, a lot of the people who I asked about it were, got me hunting Indonesian stuff for myself because um, I found the scene itself very discouraging, to tell you the truth. Like I thought that the, my impression as a collector coming into the foreign comic collecting scene a couple of years ago was that no matter what I asked about, the line was, here, look at all my five copies. You can't have one. You can't find one. I know all about this and I've asked everybody and they're all say it's impossible. <laughs> you shouldn't even try. These are super expensive and I'm not gonna quote you a price. And again, I'm, they're <laughs> not for sale. <laughs> and I'm not gonna give you any hints. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, that's not very helpful. Uh, and it, it just really put a fire under me to be like, you know what? I can Google search as well as you can. I can use translate as well as you can. I can reach out and find people. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the world is huge. It's not small. It's not like 20 friends, you know, it's like 7 billion people and you can find stuff if you set your mind to it. So, you know, scarcity is in the eye of the beholder. You, you think the sex six to 10, it could be 600 to a thousand. Um, and that got me going beyond any of the normal contacts that we have. Did we just lose John? Uh, in 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 FCC and trying to make my own contacts. Oh, well, that sucks because I've I've always felt like people were pretty helpful in the group. You, you know, are very helpful. Scott is very like some people are, but. We, you have to understand, as comic collectors, it doesn't bring it doesn't bring out our best. Like we have to, you when you guys are cool and you guys are welcoming, it's because you make an effort. You make a strong effort because I know deep inside, like when you start getting into comics, it turns you into you know, it it turns you into collectors. Well, there, like, we all yeah, there are some bad habits. Comics. That's us. We're all collector scum when it comes down to the stuff we love, you know? Like, we nobody wants to pay more than they have to. Everybody has a chase list. Everybody uh -huh. feels like their stuff is valuable more than the market says and don't want, it, don't, don't want to sell it and then see somebody else get more, you know, in, in, in a year. Like, we have all of this stuff that we don't want to be made fools of and, and you know, and it, 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 it's intention against the rest of our personalities is that, 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 you know, we don't want to be dicks and we want to be helpful and we want to have people who we trade with and that, you know, we're friendly with. Um, but you can't psych yourself out of being a dick, I think, with comics. It's one of the most fascinating things in the world because there's so much of it and it's so cool and you want it all. It's, um, it, 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 it's, it's too much. Comics have always been like that for me. Like, I can't go to San Diego because it's, it's just too much it's too it's too good i want it all it's too many scratches to itch <laughs> it's, i know it, what you mean yeah it's like if you're you focus on foreigns and you're like okay you can appreciate this because you love ecs like i can never completely abandon my interest in ec so i've got to have some in my collection and i've i in the past i admit that i've hawked a few to pay for like foreign books and i'm like was that a good idea can i replace it but I think to your point, you know, is if you when you get into foreign books, we all joke that you start hawking your American books. Yeah, that's and when I, the sickness gets bad. But it, you, you, what you do is you you nailed it, Joe. It's because we we love comics, and it we're our own worst enemy. It you prioritize the foreigns, and it doesn't mean that you don't appreciate the other stuff that you've collected over the years. But it creates a competition internally, and your your wallet just can't keep up with it. So I think, I think that's part of the challenge of this hobby too. Is it's um, you have to take it in. You have to you have to you have to balance it. Yeah, you have to remain ba as balanced as possible. And and you know, as far as the FCC group, at least at its iteration on Facebook, I've I've often tried to make like a, a kind of balance in my head of sharing teaching 
and consuming, which is what we're doing when we buy the books, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And and it's and it's it, I, I think I think within the group because I think that the people that are kind of that lean in the foreign direction anyway tend to be outside of the box thinkers, but also very passionate. You know, the foreign I hate using the word niche, but you know the people doing this stuff, you having to go and hunt Indonesian books and making connections, it's not like normal average comic book collecting. It, it it draws different types of people that are into that kind of thing. And that passion and that kind of I, I want it all kind of drive, I could see how it could make a lot of these guys just kind of squeeze up and squeeze their ass. I'm not gonna I'm not going to um, name names, but we know that there's guys out there that have twenty five of a key and you know and there's guys that have ten or fifteen of a certain key or I mean the I was much more resentful of foreign comic collectors to begin with than I am now. And I reflect on that a lot because I definitely did feel like the foreign field was full of people who had these treasures and were adamant about never letting them go. And, uh, you know, with every day, I just sadly can relate to it more. Of course, you don't want to let it go. Well, we all know as comic collectors, we know the experience of being the first to like something that that gets crazy. Like we've all been like people who bought who bought something off the newsstand that like nobody would ever pay attention to, and like now it's the biggest entertainment property in the world. Like we, we, we've seen that. So that's there's nothing new for us to be early adopters to something that a lot of other people are going to come. So. I, I think it's natural for us to feel like every single foreign book we own is undervalued and that we probably would regret selling everyone. And that, but it creates this weird situation where everybody goes and there's a certain number of sellers who I also would be very resentful of. Um, but I've really made my peace with them. I think that they're right. I think they're doing the right thing. A bunch of sellers who would go out there and wouldn't really sell, but would put up items at ridiculously inflated prices that you think yeah. nobody's ever going to pay. That. I've seen that. Nobody's ever going to pay for this, and uh, and it's really frustrating. I think to myself, you know, if they were at half of the price, they'd be making a lot of money, and I would buy it. But at that price, you know, like eight hundred, I can't do it. Um, and I just had to remind myself because I've been in the situation where I buy the thing, and I just think, you know. If I were to put this up for 800, I'd be doing a favor even if nobody bought it because you have these books and you just think just putting it up is doing a yeah, it's just awareness. Just, just putting just awareness. Putting awareness. Yep. If somebody went and actually hit the buy button, I would be the fool. I would be yeah. the one writing it unless you would regret it's an undercopy, unless it's an undercopy and even if it is an undercopy, I'll be the one regretting it because even the crazy price is you know going to be seem low because nobody really does know about this and we are so inside that it, it, it it's sometimes easy to forget like how early of early adopters we are i mean we're like oh yeah opening trade routes even like with this indonesian stuff i know i'm gonna sell all my indonesian books and it's i i expect some of them will do really well and i will definitely look back in five years and wish and everybody who will look at those prices will wish that they could they could get them, but I just don't know how you can jumpstart a hobby and hold on to your stock. Like all of the all of those players who you know, if you were to ask about Robert Bierbaum or any or or Chuck Rosansky or any of the kids who brought the pedigrees to collection, I bet you they wish that they'd put together that they'd put aside Mile Highs or Tom Riley copies of their own. But you can't do that. You can't hold and sell. I you know. think Chuck actually did. He wrote an article that he saved his business by hawking a bunch of his holdbacks because he had to buy a new warehouse. God bless but I know him. what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah like you have to sacrifice books in order to move the market a little bit. I've done that on a few books. But also then you got to think, what, what are you going to do with those proceeds? Are you going to reinvest and find another stockpile of stuff to sell? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and there's I, always I, something out there. There's always yeah. something you can pick up. And I also don't resent people who stack copies of the same issue anymore because that is also a valid and, in a lot of ways, unavoidable approach. Because once you buy into it, you're sort of buying into the 
to the SKU, to the stock keeping unit, to like the idea of the thing. And then as a comic collector, you want it in its original shape. You want it to be as nice looking as it, as it came off the stand, which is nice. Comics run off, I will say this, like as somebody who did retail, getting those boxes of fresh printed comics, they look beautiful. <laughs> this comic is beautiful. Yeah. It, it, just, it just is. Yeah, I will never get over that of seeing like a, a, a high grade copy. I don't think it's just an academic thing. Um, and you always want the better copy. You always want, so 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 it, it, until you have the file copy that's the 9.8, you're always gonna be accumulating. And until you see a market that actually pays what you think it's gonna be worth it to sell, it doesn't feel like it's legitimate and that people are actually paying something that shows that they understand how rare and desirable it is. You're just gonna sit on your copies. What are three of your favorite Indonesians that you have now? Well, um, <laughs> hard question. Not not your top three. Just like three that you for like that are maybe ex reasons. <laughs> yeah, just hey, you know, I love my this favorite. Book. You know, I, that's my favorite yeah. Indo. Just that's, you know, that's, that's an amazing Indo. And just by the way, you know, Indonesia has a very storied relationship to that particular issue in Irv Novik storyline because the interior of that as you 227 does not exist in that comic but it was elaborated by a different artist in a different format in a multi-series of Batman mm. um, as a separate series mm. and it redrawn it very interestingly redrawn that whole blind I'd like to see that yeah, yeah I'd it, like to see that it's very Pretty cool it's a very cool um, thing. Now, as far as uh, the stuff that I like the best, let me grab a couple and I'll, and I'll, 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 I'll share stuff that, I mean, some that you guys are going to instantly be like, oh, that's really cool. And I want to copy and Trust me, I'm looking for copies. Well, <laughs> And so are you accepting, are you accepting claim, offers? I'll claim it before you put show it. <laughs> and some of the stuff that I just like, and I probably maybe nobody else will, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, these apocryphal Star Wars. Oh yeah, that's awesome. I love that. I love that. I just found out about that recently, Joey. Yeah, we we're chatting about it this morning. Yeah, you sent that picture over, and I sent it in the Star Wars thread. I was like, "Hey guys, have you seen this one? I had never seen it. It's yeah. so cool looking." That guy, the artist, that has such an interesting history. His name is Leo. Um, and he also signed as his, his work as King. And he had been working in Indonesia comics from, I think, about 65 to at least 83, doing everything from religious comics, almost like Jack Chick style, uh, Naraka hell pamphlets, um, to superhero stuff in the late 60s, uh, to very, very loose adaptations of Disney properties. Uh, like Snow White and Bambi to um, really, really loose interpretations of King Features properties like Phantom and Popeye to ultimately um, doing some <laughs> really off the wall interpretations of, uh, of other properties like Star Wars. So he's like, he, he did a, he did a, a, a series of, of, of Star Wars stories that are just really, really weird. Can I see the cover again, Joey? Sure. I just I, I love the Chewbacca. He's like a he's like a a fucking ape slash what? What is he? The way the that, yeah, their characterizations are are fun. I mean, they it, it almost is like IDW pre IDW. <laughs> it's such a neat book. Uh, the same artist. Uh, one of the coolest comics that I've got. Is this guy, which is a, um, a hard oh, wow. cover? Ooh, that's thick. And it, it collects um, all of Leo, this time signing as King, all of his non branded superhero works from 1969, uh, hmm. which is very interesting and um, was amongst the first color comics that I've seen published in Indonesia. Hmm. Although they only had like one or two pages at the front of the book that were in color. You know that's that's something, and it's it's, it's sort of a, a startling thing and unexpected thing to say. 
of the spider variant, which I have put a lot of effort into trying to document, but I'm by no means. Yeah, I mean, you've said it before. You can't go wrong with Spider Man. He's he is the star of all comics. And of all of the spider variants, this guy is my absolute favorite. This is hmm. black black spider. Laba Hitam. Laba Laba being spider, Hitam being black. Contra Pambajak Udara, the air hijackers. So you'll see that uh, he's actually up in the clouds fighting some uh, terrorists. And he's all black. And he's all black. Uh, and I just oh, love so like that. The, that is pretty cool. Uh, and that one is from uh, a, this guy. This this artist only did a couple of them. He had a very. I wonder if that had any influence with the the symbiote. Yeah. I mean, not, probably not because you know, even though they call him Black Spider, you wouldn't know that unless you translated it. It doesn't like it's not like a lot of big panels that emphasize the blackness of his costume the way mm. this you know like a black spider of, of, of the 80s did mm -hmm. it was also it was also a black spider with all of the stripes that spider-man normally would have and all the webbing as opposed to the uh the web free design yeah. of the black yeah spider from secret huh. wars that's um, really cool but just, I, wonder uh, if it was a, I wonder if it was a printing thing though like maybe it made it pop on a black and white page or you know it just i think it might have been more speaking to uh the ambitions of the artists as an anchor because they had a different division of labor i think most of the artists indonesian artists ink their own material they also i think lettered their own material so black spider is inked much heavier there's a, you know there's a lot more pigmentation per page oh, yeah to do the shadows of his costume than there would normally be. So I think that that had to have been a stylistic choice that the author really wanted to do, um, wanted to wanted to ink his spider character that way. And that made a lot more sense for it to be black spider instead of red spider. What's the content like in that book? I mean, is it consistent with the cover? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it looks like that, um, but in other words, are they using like Spider Man on the cover, but no content related to a Spider Man? No, very strongly related. Storyline. Okay. That, that that one is uh is very strongly related. As you're right to ask, it's all over the map. Uh, some mm -hmm. have no bearing. Some have a lot of bearing. That happens to be one where uh, the cover is a really good indication of what the interior style is. Uh, and then I think my favorite book, my favorite Indonesian book. Um, is an annual, um, and I believe that this is from 1970. Hold on, I'm gonna I'll pop you up here. Oh, look at that! Look at that Cyclops. And this Looks is like called. A... Go ahead. Oh. Aneka and Anaka, or Aneka. I'm not sure what the pronunciation is, but that's that 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 uh, translates into various variety. Ah. And you'll see that that's, that this cover painting by Kus Bram, who is very renowned for being um, the artist on the most popular Indonesian spider variant, Laba Mera, Red Spider, and it's closest to, you know, the standard American spider. He became in demand as a cover artist, and this is one of his earlier painted covers. The interior is, it's like um, an annual that repurposes older published material, so the cover just basically shows all the different genres that were popular in Indonesia at the time. So you see romance, you see Western, um, you see a detective there underneath the A, mm -hmm. um, the Cyclops, superhero. the superhero in the back, this Hercules, because they have, uh, there, there, there was a, a subgenre of like Roman and um, uh, Greek gods. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether Cyclops plays into that, but I just think it's a beautiful composition by, by, by Kus. That's a that's yeah, cool. That's great cover. Yeah, that's you, cool. Joey, I don't know how much time you get to spend looking through, but do you see? Do you feel like they tend to be more anthology based, or do you see something of a universe back, existing, like with the Laba Laba? Like, does does it feel like there's continuity at all, or 
Well, I'm learning to read Indonesian now. Oh. <laughs> That's cool. And, I... and, and, and I'm trying to use comics to help me because I've noticed a bunch of things about them and, 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 it, and it works it, that these Indonesian comics actually factor into some of the technological code work that I do. And one of the things um, that I'm doing right now is I've shipped I've shift out about 3,000 pages worth of reproduction Indonesian comic material to um, a guy who's helping me scan them in, and we're going to try to turn them into a big comics corpus. It's all of material published between 68 and about 77. Are you uh, going to use it like an OCR to translate it, or are you... Yeah, so what I'm doing is I'm designing my own um, OCR pipeline, and I'm going to be writing about this um, professionally, uh, to do a big bulk translation uh, of a solution that's going to take all 3,000 pages and probably in like 10 minutes throw them at like an Amazon AWS server where it'll do like a bunch of segmentation, try to identify all the words, try to translate them, spit a bunch of results back, which will probably be at best like 85% correct. And then what I'll be doing is um, designing a UI that makes it possible for people like us to go and just like see the obvious error, errors and mark them and then, or, or mark things as correct OCR. Um, it's a little bit more complicated when it when when it gets OCR is more complicated for handwriting than it is for you know typography, uh -huh. but it's not impossible. Um, in particular, when you use the same letter, or what I could do is I can train <laughs> to, to to recognize a particular type of handwritten script, uh, and then it'll become really accurate. Huh. So, so uh, so I think I'm going to be able to have um, both really good. OCR of the original Indonesian and an improvable English or whatever language translation of that stuff. Um, and that'll be before the end of the year. It might even have demos um, probably every month for the, for, for the rest of the year. I'll, I'll be sharing uh, some of my work there. That's some, crazy. Of it some of it publicly. That's really cool. I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. that's actually interesting, too, because that gets people able to access that material and, and, you know, get interested in it just as a as a as, as something to entertain versus just yeah. a something they can't do anything with beyond look at the cover. So, yeah, it's an academic. Intriguing. It allows yeah, I mean, academic opportunities. I don't it's, it's not like I I have for the last two years expected at any moment Google to roll out some sort of like, you know, Google Lens feature that essentially does it. But since they're not doing it and since I don't mind building it myself, since if you just the world of off the shelf parts and API available services means that every element, I don't have to invent it. I just have to piece it together and make it work. So good for Google if they do it, but it doesn't exist now. So uh, it's, a, it's a really good test case and I'm going to be using it to showcase some database technology from, you know, my sponsor is going to be a database company um, and, um, uh, you know, it will work with a lot of different databases, but the, but the OCR and the machine learning parts of it will, you know, just be using um, the best practices from those industries to get good translations, readable translations. And you know, you know why it excites me because I'm gonna connect it back over to the whole reprint edition debate. You know, just today I was looking at a CGC uh, thread where someone was saying, "Why are they asking so much money for this foreign edition or for this foreign?" I don't remember what it was, something. Um, and someone was saying, "It's just a foreign reprint," is what someone said in that thread. And so I, I always smile at that because one of the main arguments in the reprint slash edition type debate is that through the simple act of translation, it's fundamentally changing that initial story. Once we have machine learning where we can go back into a lot of these foreign editions, I can't freaking learn all the different languages. But if I can go back in there and I can start making the comparisons, start looking at the continuity uh, changes, start looking at things that were dropped for whatever reason, 
that academic ability, it, it's just going to go back, I think, and prove, listen, you, you naysayer pieces of it, shit. Yeah. These are yeah. unique, and, and you're not giving even just the translators the respect that they deserve in translating that material. That, that's what excites me about your project is once we're able to really go in there and start looking at those differences, we're going to be able to really come to that debate and go, no, this is not a foreign fucking reprint. You can't take the translation and compare it exactly to the American. There's all kinds of little innuendos or little, little tiny little underlying things that fundamentally change and make that Indo book, that Mexican book, that Brazilian book its own fucking thing. And and so by, that's what excites me. Anyway, so yeah, and there's a, and a lot of the stuff that I'm looking for, uh, I'm looking at and paying attention to and collecting are books that I expect to really yield very eye-opening contrasts between original and translated. Exactly. Yeah, those know, excite uh, me. I, I tend to collect um, stuff with um, more controversial social content because I I, I want to know how does an Arabic book translate you know the the protest issue of batman 227 or something you know like i would so say well you want you yeah. want to know how, how they how they handle some of those things it's also why i put such um special emphasis into international translated editions of bizarro because the syntax mm -hmm. of bizarro is so formal huh yeah you know like the way that it's like bizarro always speaks in a negative construction and it was sort of reversed our meaning it's like i'm just dying to know how much how of that they handle happens. that yeah multi translation uh if at all you know um but uh yeah there's just so much to that's exciting that's cool to discover there. hey can you can you clear something up for me real quick joey just because uh -oh. people have asked yes john Mineraga, six Malawan galaxy yeah there was some i don't remember where it was but someone was saying they still thought that it was still licensed through uh, Lucasfilm and through Marvel or whatever. There's no way, right? I mean, not a chance. Put a, let's put an end to that. Oh, no, 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 no chance. Okay. It's a bootleg. Okay, thank you. That's that, that's what I assumed. Uh, a bootleg and a very interesting one because because uh, yeah. uh, that was a Sinkowitz, Sinkevich, right? That, that uh, I don't remember. Grew, or was that uh, uh, Howard Chaikin? Chaikin. 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 Mitaraga adopted a bit of a Chaikin stylistic approach to that. In that's, that's, it's very interesting to compare. Yeah, I, 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 I love the interiors. Like comparing the interiors to issue two of Chaikin's work, it's, it's Mitaraga is an amazing dude. Yeah. I mean, I don't know as much as you on the different artists, but Mitaraga, I tend to really, really dig his work yeah he's um, great. i mean and from so uh, god the indonesian the indonesian nut is so big to crack there's so much there it's crazy i don't think that there was any legitimate licensed material coming out of indonesia before before miserund before was it that, miserund? that i'm assuming was licensed and that's from what night yeah yeah, and, and there was, uh, yeah, I think that the Miserun material is probably the first official licensed material. You, you're probably right. I Rest. think that. You'll see stuff by the publisher Cypress, who operated from about 1979 all throughout the 80s. Mm -hmm. And I assumed that that was licensed, but now I'm thinking it was on, it was either unlicensed or quasi-licensed. Uh, <laughs> this, <is, laughs> this is Cypress, right? It's the CP? Yeah, because if you look like if you look at the Cypress edition of Ali versus Superman, that's entirely redrawn. Not a single page. They they, they went and, hmm. and re redrew the entire page, every issue. The Ali and Thor, which is another treasury, like I think that's a purely unofficial sequel to the to the Superman. Huh. Uh, yeah, Ali. because if they had the license, they would have had access. There wouldn't have been any reason to redraw it. Unless right. it's a, unless it's a freaking boot, unless it's a bootleg. Yeah, there was there there wasn't any there wasn't any reason. Only the reason why they wouldn't license is because how would you get that license? You know, it, like even if they had a license, even if Lucas Art had a licensing department that wanted to do international stuff in 1979, 
like who would you talk to? I mean, it's, in Indonesia. Yeah, I, I don't. No, know. no. Who would Indonesia talk to? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. In, in, in I don't America, know that, that that would even it like, needed what fee. Like, what do you think they would charge them? I mean, who knows? It just doesn't make any sense. In a way, what I love about Indonesia is it's just so implausible. The idea that they would have officially licensed stuff. Uh, you, you, and it's so far off the radar in terms of they probably were never even noticed that oh, that's yeah. just all entirely academic. Like the idea of actually having a contract or having some sort of legal framework to handle the IP Didn't was so far-fetched, it was never even a consideration. <laughs> yeah. Nobody ever asked at the printer, oh, well, are you, are you guys allowed to do it? Of course not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're just printing it. It's 2020, and Lucas still doesn't know about it. Yeah. So like what, like what license were they? There was no yeah. active global license for them to transgress. Nobody cared. Nobody still doesn't care. It would be like they couldn't get arrested. It's like that for you know couldn't get arrested. They could not get arrested for breaking the for breaking the IP. And I think for countries that were that far off the map, their choice was either to do nothing or to do bootleg. Bootlegs. And we're yeah. just lucky that some of them decided to do the bootleg. Yeah, and, and uh -huh. Indonesia is like a bootlegging paradise, man. I mean, it just it just seems like they just did whatever the hell they wanted and for so long that there's so much material there. And, and that's the thing is I'm excited, too, about just the bootleg angle that you've taken, Joey. Um, I think it's neat that, that – and that I, I think there's going to be collectors within the hobby that are going to – kind of go, you know what, I really like all these bootlegs. I'm going to kind of move in that direction um, because it is so fascinating and it's got so many different elements to it. I mean, the this simple, the redraw, I, I'll, I'll tell anyone that's out there, you can find the, the, uh, the interiors of this book because I know that I've seen them. Just yep. comparing what John Mitaraga did to the Taken work is... It's just, it's awesome. It's, if you it's were, rad. if you were to go, if you were to pull out a comic recreation of Star Wars number one that somebody in sixth grade did in 1980, mm -hmm. an elementary school in Kentucky, I'd be interested in that. Yeah. From some like, <laughs> like just for, for some kid with crayons. The fact that like the, the that you have professional artists who are you know just going wild with their own interpretations. That definitely shows a market that's so way outside of, um, oh yeah, the radar of, of of anybody. And it, yeah, I love that. I I love adaptations. They call it sort of a, um, they call it um, the original borrow tradition. Huh. Which, original uh, borrow. So they or, so they original they, borrow. Yeah. So they because it looked like you know the art looked like um, like John basically took. And copied some elements of the of Taken style, but then it it's like dripping in his own unique the way he draws the eyes, the way he like it's just it's super cool, man. It, the the Indonesian bootlegs are rad. Well, one of the things that I saw in uh, when I was going and looking at some of the press about revival movements of Indonesian comics, you know, over mm -hmm. the last ten years. Uh, and they would go and they would talk to uh, the woman who ran Maranatha, which was the comic book store publisher that had been operating. Yeah. And it's, indeed, it's still operating. Yep. I read an article about that. Yeah. Since 1961, making it, you know, as old as I think some of the oldest existing comic book stores in the world. And she recalls that during the heyday of the superhero boom from 69 to 73, that they were so popular that they had a line of artists around the block who wanted to present their work and get printed. And it made me think that mm. in a way what they were doing was um, sort of a predecessor to Kinko's. Like they mm. were sort of a copy center and people who really wanted to do their own thing were actually coming and Cause she said, I could have charged them. They would have paid me to print it instead of <laughs> the other way around. Wow. And, and she, you know, she's just making a joke, but she wasn't making a joke. I'm sure she could have charged them. That was Kinko's. Like if you go yeah. ten years into the future, uh, when I got into the comics, like APAs were really some of the my, the first the first customers to my comic store in eighty four and eighty five were people who were drawing their own comics and publishing it in the uh, amateur press association 
which were quite popular yeah. in the eighties and nobody does now. But uh, that tradition of you know fan artists, you realize that just drawing one comic book in a way turns you into a comic book professional. It's transformative to you as an artist just to finish twenty four or thirty two pages and get Once it printed and get it in a store. You're basically a comic book artist. Like you've had to deal with so much of page composition, and character, and just panel composition that the artist you were when you did your splash so different and so like primitive compared to the artist that did your coming next final page that like your second comic if you get to it will be damn near professional it'll almost be publishable well and let's huh. talk about let's talk about that too joey because we we talked about this on the phone the other day about how so you had these comic shop almost small press operations throughout indonesia right and they would be, correct me if I'm wrong, but they would be kind of geographic in location. So they would be kind of maybe one was one store maybe had two or three locations, right? And they would produce material. And then you might have another almost small press Kinko's in another part of the country that was producing their own material. I, I, I'm so, not 100% sure about how many different places were doing it. I know that specifically Maranatha had a two-story operation, I think existing at the same location that they're at today, mm -hmm. except they had an upstairs where, according to them, you know, back in their heyday, they would have like 20 people working, doing duplicates mm -hmm. and doing pr print runs. But that was in the 70s, not now. And that was through genres that they don't do anymore. Uh, you know, now they'll do traditional Wayang or puppetry and internal um, folklore related stuff. But uh, it, but I, I think if there, if you had if you if you possibly had the different kind of publishers creating the different, I, I would assume that some would be rarer than others or harder to find because they would had either smaller print runs or less stores or is is there within the Indonesian back market, is there an awareness of specific books that are more highly desirable just simply because they were maybe a smaller operation or uh, uh, an artist that maybe didn't do a whole lot of material? Do you well, see well, that kind of change? I, I'll say this and we can we, we can maybe leave off after this because this is going to take us back to a question that we brought up at the beginning, which was the, peer, which was the concept of periods and Mm -hmm. uh, you know, gold and silver, bronze, as relates to Indonesia versus our own periodicity. Um, and I, I think that to answer your question, stuff that came out in the first three years of what I think of as their silver age, which is basically 1968 to 71, mm -hmm. is acknowledged to be super duper rare and hard to get. And uh, whatever the print run, and I can't even ballpark it, I can't tell you whether it's a thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand. I can't tell you any ballpark, but whatever it is, it was small enough that those comics, those originals that got reprinted, by the way, and a lot of the Indonesian mm -hmm. comics you see at the seventies, especially the Lava Mara stuff, those are reprinted bundle editions oh, of things that earlier stuff, 68, 69, and seventy. Hmm. They got pr reprinted every year with a different cover. Hmm. So like when you see the lizard book, Scott, like that's all the same story. It's just with a different cover for each year, annual release. Interesting. But the, but the interior is gonna is gonna be the same stuff. So, but when I with the the the, the, the first printings of floppy, non-square bound, non-perfect bound, non-graphic novel, the original, thin, small, those uh, uh, of the first two years of particular they are known to be very, very, very hard. And, you know, I just don't think that you can, I, don't, I think it would be very difficult to find a copy that wasn't super duper beat up for less than a hundred bucks. Um, and I think that those are gonna be the things that um, make it first to the $500,000, you know, realm. Yeah. The really rare, the, the, the older. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 they're very abbreviated, splashy, Silver Age of the first era of superhero popularity that then it lasted for a good fifteen years, but mm -hmm. I get the sense I don't have photo documentation of it, like confirming that it was a craze. But you can tell there was a bit of a craze. Hmm. Interesting. Is there is, is there a big Indonesian back issue type collector? 
Like there, I know there's got to be there, I, in there my is. research. I've seen the different there are, pages there are. of people talking and selling and talking about them. I, I mean, I, I that fascinates me too. Just well, one of the uh, things the I was local Indonesian collectors. There are active collectors, and there are, is an active back issue market, and. Um, it would be very difficult to get, you won't find, for instance, you won't find truly collectible stuff for too much lower than like 15 bucks, just because there are enough collectors who will buy at that $15, which is like the 200 mm -hmm. uh, level for them. Yeah. Uh, they, they will, they're going to buy it regardless. Um, they will also buy it up to 50 bucks. Like there's a there's a healthy trade in comics in the twenty to fifty dollar range just amongst Indonesians. So like hmm. that's not gonna that, that that's not gonna be like that's not gonna count as like international dollars. We start yeah. getting to like okay maybe international buyers is really more like at about one hundred and fifty bucks. That's when you know you, it will sell. People Indonesians will will pay that much for a really heavily chased book. Um, but it's there, it's gonna be competitive among international buyers. Um, but all the international buyers aren't necessarily American. There's plenty of Malaysian, Japanese, and other Southeast Asian collectors who have childhood memories as collecting those books because before manga was really huge in Japan, I think that there was a lot of export of Indonesian comics to Japan. Huh. Oh, holy cow, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, so, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I think uh, we are rolling them real long, and I would yeah. love to do another show kind of we need to. into the specifics of, you know, the Indonesia. Indonesian publishing yeah. and, and history, because you sent me a Google Drive full of things I haven't even really had a chance to process, all the different versions of the heroes and all the different artists and all of that, so I, I would love to do that. Um, I appreciate you kind of coming on and sharing your story and, and talking about what you've seen in the you know the comic market as well as just the foreign market in the last decade or so and and i would agree it's it's a really interesting changing place and i like your opinion on scarcity and not wanting to kind of commit to it because it, it 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 makes sense and uh it, it, it's good to kind of make sure we're all thinking for the, for the long term not just what we've seen prior so i agree i think uh, we're yeah. going to look back i mean aside from being mortified by looking at ourselves maybe we actually will depending on how decrepit we get in 10 years, we might actually be really envious of the way we look right now, if you can believe that. But aside from that, I think there's going to be a lot to learn from what, as time goes on and us uh, just sort of reflecting on our assumptions now versus what they turn out, because you know things are going to change. Absolutely. Like 10 yeah. years, we're going to look problem. back, and, 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 and it's going to, all this time and all the stuff we're doing, it's going to be interesting in the future to look back on. It's not going to seem like wasted time. It's going to seem like, oh wow, we were there and we were trying to do the smartest we could under the circumstances. Uh, and people will wish, like you know, people have always wished that they could travel back in time and you know get their value for it. Yeah. Time. Well, we, we'll, we'll see a few things we did right and a few things we did wrong, and hope we did a few more right than wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's where I'm at. Less less moon potato heads that stayed stagnant. <laughs> Yeah, I'm keeping my potato head, you know. I didn't even know they made a moon potato head. That's why I was like, "Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that." That was the first. That was the first moon moonshot. Was putting putting the potato on the moon, and then <laughs> some people primate. Thank you for uh, coming on, Joey. Yes, Joey, I, I really, really enjoyed it. Great. I've talked to you a few times privately, and you are a wealth of knowledge. So, I really enjoyed it, Scott. Thank you for thank coming you, on. Scott. Um, Always, Matt, guys. Matt and I will oh. be back next week if he can get moving. With, yeah, we got uh, another, a show to work on. Another uh, book series. We're going to do the uh, Superman 199, 199. Flash Race. Whoa. So, uh, something a little different. And uh, again, you know, thank you all for having fun talking to us, learning. We're all learning this hobby together. And uh, check out our friends at cbsicomicbookinvest.com for all your general comic knowledge as well as you know your foreign fixes matt is writing over there and doing some articles and uh the more people taking notice and, and talking about whether they're modern they're old um just just the market is getting more awareness everywhere so yeah more mm -hmm. people too more new blood coming in absolutely so we'll it's see addictive. you all it's addictive we yes. know it you know it to, to to see them is to love them yep exactly 
All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon.